scientist. Ludovic Kennedy introduces an extortion case solved in Sydney by the discovery of indelible evidence. For this, the last indelible evidence program in the present series, we return to Australia. And there, in December 1980, an attempt was made to extort money from one of the big department stores by planting a bomb in the toy department. The lives of children and other Christmas Eve shoppers were threatened, but when the police and forensic people found some electrical tape in the lavatory, they were on their way to notching up another success. As usual, the police and technical experts play themselves, while the villains are played by actors. There's a great deal of apprehension right from the outset of this inquiry that if we did not catch this person or, or the persons involved, Woolworths would be subject to a series of bombings and people would be maimed or injured. It was a callous act placing an explosive device in the kids section of a store on Christmas Eve, knowing full well that children would be in that area, and it was extremely fortunate there was nobody who was seriously injured and in fact killed. I was looking for any article that might assist us in identifying the author of the crime. It was a difficult job because the toys were blown up with the force of the explosion and they had um, cogs in them, pieces of wire, springs, etc., and uh, the device itself we were looking for might contain those uh, items. The examination at the scene on the first night, uh, we finished up in the wee hours of the morning.
I went to the second floor of the Woolworths building to uh, use the gents' convenience there, and uh, when I was in the cubicle of the toilet, I noticed on the floor two pieces of insulation tape, or there were three actually, two were stuck together. As an improvised explosive device operator, you build a number of devices yourself and you realise it's important to have a device that's not going to blow up unintentionally. It's normal to have some form of a safety mechanism that's going to be released just prior to placing the device. A simple uh, safety device would be to have two wires that aren't joined, in other words, separated by tape, and remove the tape at the last moment and join the two wires up and the circuit's then armed. We keep everything we find at the scene because you never know when something apparently insignificant might assist in solving the crime. A letter was received at the Woolworth store at their head office. This was a demand for the sum of $1 million. Inspector Chivers had carried out an examination of the document, but at that particular time he was unable to produce anything of an evidentiary nature which would assist our inquiry. The letter was signed by a person who gave the name Mr Dunmore. Chairman's office. It's Mr. Dunmore. Hello. This is Mr. Dunmore. Did you get my letter? Yes. All right, I ring you on Friday. We made a number of attempts to trace the telephone calls to Woolworths. Mr. Dunmore rang on 13 occasions. In the calls, he set out how he wanted the money made up in the ransom bag and also inserted a number of threats. Now, when you say bombing again, that you're going to keep the police out of the the exchange at Town Hall uh, was an antiquated one and the telecom were unable to assist us with those particular traces. How are you? Fine. Is your courier standing by? Yes. I want you to call him Mr. Johnson. The money should be ready at 2 p.m. You will be contacted by a Mr. Bridge. Now, Mr. Johnson is to have a full tank of petrol and a Gregory Street directory. He is to wear a blue boiler suit, white shirt and red tie. One of our detectives was chosen to take the place of the Woolworths courier who would carry the ransom money. We gave him a conspicuous orange Volvo so he could easily be followed. Hello? This is Mr. Bridge. Mr. Johnson is to take the money to the Highway Hotel at Wentworthville. Map reference 139G5. He must be in the lounge bar by 4pm. Uh, what car will he be driving? Mr. Johnson will be driving an orange Volvo station wagon. Registration number... Mr. VKG, we now have this vehicle under observation. It looks like it's about to depart now. Where I born and target right now is heading west into Park Street Lane. We also had the cooperation of the Metropolitan Traffic Control Office, which was able to monitor the courier's movements whilst in the city. The VKG, that vehicle has now crossed George Street and is heading down the side of the town hall into George Street. Looks like it's heading out towards the uh, western suburbs area. Copy that into the western suburbs area. They have eyeball of the premises. The courier's entered, carrying the bag. Copy that, Alpha 6. 
Using electronic devices, the courier was able to convey to us the instructions received from the extortionists on the phone. This information was coordinated by the operations centre and passed on to the various mobile surveillance units. This meant they could get into position ahead of the courier at each new location. Be there by 1800 hours. Would you proceed to the vicinity? CI 40 Alpha Base, yeah, we copied that. We'll proceed to the next location. We'll call you when we're in position. Alpha 1 to Alpha 3, we've picked up a target. Copy that. Copy. The target's approaching Rose Bale, New South Head Road, ETA 3 minutes. CI 40 to command. Yeah, we're in position. Yeah, we're in position. Command by. We're in position at the premises. Copy that, CI 40. Alpha 6 to command. Courier has left the car with a bag and entered the premises. Yeah, Brisbane Street to VKG. We now have that vehicle under observation once again. Can I have a location? Yeah, Courier has been directed to the Bonavista Hotel, Military Road, Mossman. Would you proceed to the vicinity? CI 40, copy. Yeah, Brisbane Street, that vehicle is in lane 2, now adjacent to the southern violence of the bridge. Continue to report the Courier Street to Bonavista Hotel. Copy that. The cars. The courier has been directed to go to the Taronga Park Wharf, tie the bag to the wharf and throw it into the harbour. CI-30 to Alpha Base, proceeding to the location. The courier has been placed under pressure to get there as fast as he can. One copy that. The extortionists led us on what we call a paper chase all over the city, which ended up on a wharf in Sydney Harbour. Taronga Park Wharf and wait further instruction. CI-40 to command. Copy that. Camper, copy that. The Alpha teams are now on foot and have taken up their positions. Uh, they will maintain eyeball of the bag at all times. Copy that, CI 40. Alpha 1 to base. Command by. The courier is on the wharf with the bag. We had two police launchers standing by and they moved into positions out of sight of anybody who might be watching the wharf. Headlines, Nemesis. They're taking up a position around the western headland from the Toronto Park Wharf. Copy that, Nemesis. Command, the bag is in the water, the bag is in the water. Copy that, Alpha 6. After a while, police divers were introduced to the scene and checked that the bag was still intact. Launch Nemesis. Divers report that the bag is still intact and hanging about 10 foot below the surface. Alpha 1 to command. Launch, There's still no movement. The bag is still intact. had expected to find the bag sitting on the bottom of the harbour, not able to locate it in the dark, Gregory Norman McCarty had made the mistake of surfacing to find it still attached to the wharf. Oh, I was approached. I was offered to do the diving to uh, retrieve the bag. Who offered you this job? I'd rather not say. When were you offered this job? A couple of months ago in Queensland. Uh, I was told there was a job going down. How did you get down to Sydney? Hitchhiked. Is that your diving gear outside? Yeah. You mean to tell me that you hitchhiked carrying all that equipment? 
Yeah. Most of his story had very little substance. You understand that we're apprehensive about further explosions at Woolworths? There won't be any more explosions. How can you say that? And we were satisfied that he was a principal in this plot to obtain the money from Woolworths. Detective Sergeant Holden examined the gear taken from McCarty and he traced the tanks, the diving tanks, to a firm at Coogee and we ascertained that they'd had the tanks stolen from one of their stores at Huskisson on the south coast. There was a suspect for the robbery at Huskisson. G'day, Larry. The suspect was Larry Burton Danielson. Do you recall that fellow we arrested in Sydney Harbour recently over the, uh, over the Woolworths extortion? He was a diver. Yeah. Well, the diving gear he had on was stolen from the dive shop here. Well, I wouldn't know anything about that. No. Have a look at this photograph of the fellow we arrested in the harbour. Well, I know him. He was stopping with me. That's Greg. Ah. What's his last name? We suspected that Danielson might be the man who called himself Mr. Bridge. This is Mr. Bridge. Mr. Johnson is to take the money to the Highway Hotel at Wentworth. Map reference 139G5. Certainly sounds like Danielson. You have another listen. Conference room, Des Johnson. Des, uh, Larry Danielson. I got a message to call you. Yes, mate. Uh, it's these dates I need to check with you. Since I spoke to you, I went round to John's and I, I said, said to him, look, I said, this this thing, they're, they're worried about these bloody dates. Can we, because uh, we went, um, well, we went to Nara at one o'clock on New Year's Eve because I bought a new safari suit. The police brought me a um, tape of a man known to them, Larry Danielson. And they brought me also tape of a man calling himself Bridge. And um, they asked me whether I could say that those two voices were from the same person or not. This is Mr. Bridge. It was obvious from the start that the two people were both New Zealanders. Uh, the sounds of New Zealand English are very distinctive and um, that was fairly clear. It's the short I's and E's that are particularly noticeable. This is Mr. Bridge. From the tapes, I was able to make a, a series of sonograms, sound spectrograms, just a sort of elaborate graph showing the, the way the energy is distributed in a person's voice. We went to Nara at one o'clock on New Year's Eve because I bought a new safari suit. The sonogram itself doesn't uniquely identify an individual, but you can extract measurements from it which are distinctive of the individual speaker. the measurements from the sonograms, I would then be able to process them and then I could compare them and see clearly whether these two people were the same or not. This work was going to take some time. Meanwhile, an underwater propulsion unit had been found on the floor of the harbour. This unit was obviously to be used to tow the bag with the ransom money. In relation to the suspect Danielson, the underwater propulsion unit was thought to be the proceeds of another theft in which the suspect Danielson was allegedly involved. We had to try and connect the unit to that particular robbery. On the side of the scooter there were signs of a label that had been removed. Glue was still on the side of the scooter. This was submitted along with an identifying sticker from the store in question. 
to Mr. Chan. He would make a comparison of the two glues. If the glue from the scooter matched the glue from the sticker, and if Danielson was involved in the robbery, that would connect him to the ransom drop. Mr. Chan dissolved the gum from the side of the scooter and also from the sticker. He subjected that to infrared analysis, which provides a profile of the chemical makeup of the samples. Mr. Chan's conclusion was that the two glues were similar, the only variation being that one had been immersed in salt water. There was now strong circumstantial evidence which pointed to Danielson, but we needed to find more concrete evidence of his involvement in the bombings and the extortion. There rolls of tape in there, just like the tape I found on the toilet floor. I made a physical comparison of the insulation tape from Danielson's ham against the tape that I'd found on the floor of the Woolworths building. I was able to physically match and positively identify one of the ends of the pieces of tape found on the floor of the toilet to one of the rolls that I found at Danielson's home. Detective Holden had made an examination of the underwater propulsion unit and on the negative terminal there was a piece of black insulation tape. Comparison made between the tape recovered from Danielson's home with the tape found on the floor of the toilet proves positive, which put Danielson uh, or associated Danielson with the scene of the explosion. The tape found on the underwater propulsion unit connected Danielson to the scene of the ransom drop. The conclusions drawn by Mr. Alexander Jones linked Danielson to the extortion phone calls by Mr. Bridge. This is Mr. Bridge. When I'd made measurements from the sonograms, I was able then to subject those to computer analysis and reduce each voice to a small number of underlying patterns, which I could then compare. That enabled me to form a judgment about which I was 99% uh, sure. I came to the conclusion that Danielson and Bridge were very clearly the same person. When a thorough search was made of Danielson's home, we located a notebook in amongst the music scores. There was reference to midnight special, no warning, daylight with warning. We related the notes to the actual bombings. Danielson conceded that the writing was his. He also indicated they were song titles. Uh, we did not accept that uh, explanation. You will be charged in connection with these matters. You're kidding. With Danielson wrapped up, we were left with McCarty. We didn't think he was just the diver as he claimed. Also on the pad, directions in respect to the Buena Vista Hotel at Taronga Park Zoo. Identical to those supplied to Detective Kamer prior to him throwing the ransom into the harbour. The writing was in different handwriting to that of Danielson's. If we could prove that McCarty had written these documents, it would have taken him further than being a courier. He was one of the perpetrators. It's not just one particular point you're looking for in the identification of handwriting. It's a combination of factors. The Imin Married in McCarty's handwriting and the Imin Mossman are very similar 
in the way they were formed. In the word Norman in McCarty's handwriting, the break after the M to the A and the flattening of the N is also similar to the word Mossman. There were some 17 points of similarity found between both writings. It was my conclusion that they're both written by the same person. Gregory Norman McCarty. I had nothing to do with the bombing. I was approached by this bloke, Benny, to do the diving. The handwriting implicated McCarty in the actual planning of the crime, and his story about a person called Benny had no credence. One thing I noticed when I heard Mr Dunmore's voice uh, was that there didn't seem to be any English sounds that Mr Dunmore had any difficulty pronouncing. Now, for example, we know that Italian speakers have difficulty with uh, English sounds, th and th, the th sounds. Mr Dunmore didn't show any difficulty with those. I don't think it will take you too long. It's not a hell of a lot of money, is it? Really? Wherever you looked for a sound that some language group might find difficult, Mr Dunmore could say it. The structure of the language was um, very, very sophisticated for a person of foreign origin. We really don't have any choice. I'm going to have to send you onto the open market to get the balance of them. I... He used ways of saying things that are quite elaborate, which you wouldn't expect that a foreign speaker would have a complete mastery of. It seemed to me, uh, from my observations, that the accent was probably not a foreign accent at all, but a bogus accent that had been adopted by a person who was naturally an Australian. So Joe goes back to school and he tells Maria, I know this thing. And Maria says, you tell me, Joe. But Joe says, no, 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 we go home. We were able to produce witnesses who had been present when McCarty had told stories mimicking a foreign accent. They identified this as being the one used by Mr Dunmore in extortion telephone calls. Danielson was found guilty of planting explosives in the two Woolworths and of extortion and sentenced to 20 years hard labour. This included a non-parole period of nine years. McCarty received the same sentence for the same charges, but for escaping briefly from prison before being recaptured, he had his non-parole period increased from nine to ten years. <laughs>